Oh, hello. A baby named Mango, chapter nine? Maybe nine or ten. I don't know. I can't remember. It's been a month. I've had a lot happen in a month. And it's been really great to be present and not checking in with the media. I like it. Um, but also, I think that all of my connections to all of you are really important. Every single person has been an important piece in the puzzle of my life. And if you're watching this, this is somehow an important piece in the puzzle of your life. <sighs> Back to the story. So, when I was 15 and a sophomore in high school, middle of the year, my family decided that they were going through hard financial times and it was time to claim bankruptcy and give up our beautiful house and fancy car and move in to my grandma's basement. It's only gonna be for three months, my parents say. So, you know, put most of everything in storage and just take what like, you need for a couple months. And they're like, okay, cool pack up all our stuff, put all of this crap in storage, so much stuff, <laughs> and we move into grandma's basement, there's two bedrooms down there, one for my parents, one for me and my sister, and then my brother slept out on the couch in the, the living room area, where we also set up on the side like a little mini kitchen. Um, wow, I really did not appreciate that kitchen very well at that point point in time in my life but like now that I've been living in tiny home life I appreciate that little kitchen so much my mom got so creative with that space go mom <sighs> we I continued to go to Copper Hills for the rest of the year but with my brother he would drive us he would drive me and my sister she would go over to the middle school we'd go to the high school after school We'd stop at his girlfriend's house. <laughs> and me and Kaylee would like wait outside for a while while he'd like go make out or something. I don't know what he was doing. It's so funny. We'd just like wait outside. Um, one of the times I was waiting outside, I decided to teach myself how to drive a stick shift. <laughs> That's funny. I taught myself how to ride a bike too taught myself how to drive a stick shift. Uh, now I love teaching people how to drive stick shifts. So, in moving, we would, our, our church group w would shift because um, the Mormon church in Utah, there's so many members that you go to church with the people that live near you and there's many, many, many wards, they call them. So, we, you know, we moved to a new ward. Um, new set of people to go to church with. Again, it was hard to leave going to church with this group of friends that I had grounded in deeply with and made these deep, beautiful relationships with. But I had learned that it was going to be okay because of the last experience. So... Um, <laughs> there's a friend in the new ward her name is Savannah she looked extremely familiar to me from the first time I saw her and I actually saw her before we moved there because um, my cousins also went to that they lived in that neighborhood for a long time and so we would go to church with them sometimes. So I've seen this Savannah character before. And I always thought she was really familiar. She looked so familiar, like I knew her from somewhere. But I could never pinpoint exactly from where. Well, now that I have a whole lot of perspective, you know, hindsight is 2020. Because it's 2020 now. Uh, when you see somebody who seems familiar to you, but you don't know who they remind you of, there's a reason. 
you and that person are deeply connected on some level somewhere probably and it's important to come together and explore the purpose of your relationship sometimes it's small sometimes it's just one thing that you two need to learn from each other sometimes there's huge sometimes there's years of stuff that you need to learn from each other I'm still learning from Savannah though we live you know on opposite sides of the country quite literally now I don't know I think she's still in New York so Savannah becomes a very good friend of mine in fact we get really close and Savannah gets really close with my whole family she gets close with my brother they start dating of course of course Jake dates the girls that are my best friends and Kaylee gets close and my mom gets close and my dad likes her too and we're all just like she's part of our family and it feels so good and it's so deeply connected we go to girls camp when I was 16 we went on this like hike this extra hike we go up this mountain and um this like backpacking trip just the older girls went so my sister didn't come on this trip but Savannah did and Savannah's like okay look here's what we need to do to stay warm tonight here's the trick number one you zip your sleeping bag to my sleeping bag and then we have like extra room and we cuddle yeah we cuddle and that's how we stay warm and I'm like we cuddle and like it seemed wrong for some reason somehow it seemed wrong that we cuddle but she didn't seem to think it was wrong and why was it wrong so we we did we cuddled and she showed me how to spoon she taught me how to spoon <laughs> uh, well I really liked cuddling with Savannah I really liked cuddling with Savannah. Um, Man, I remember that. That opened up cuddles, more cuddles, to like cuddling other times. I loved sleeping over and cuddling with her. It was great. She also taught my family how to hug. She was like, you guys don't know how to hug. When you guys hug, you hug like this. And it's awkward. And she's like, when you hug somebody, you want to like hold them you want to bring them into you you want to breathe them into you and coddle them make them feel good so she showed us how to hug I get compliments on my hugs all the time now thank you Savannah constantly I always think of her every time somebody's like wow your hugs are so good I'm like oh my gosh I'm so glad Savannah showed me how to hug and how to spoon In this ward, I started taking on a larger role in leadership. I'd done that some before in the other wards in the young women, like the young women's settings, the youth programs and stuff, but I felt like excited to take on leadership roles and just naturally became, you know, young women's law president whatever anyways and um, got to start planning girls camps and other mutual activities and all this stuff Um, and I think that was like some of my first training in leadership was through this church program and I really appreciated it it was awesome I loved it at the same time when I was 15 I got a job at Scone Cutter. Jake got a job there when he was 15, and when I was 15, I got a job there too. And because we lived at my grandma's house, it was close enough, I could ride my bike there. So I could easily get a job at 15 and show up to work. So I did, it was great. Started that summer, summer before uh, my junior year. Junior year comes up, and Jake's graduated and I'm getting in with these friends at church and I 
my mom asks me, hey, would you want to go to Taylorsville High instead of Copper Hills? And the answer was very simply clear. Yeah. Yeah, totally. That sounds good. Um, before I was afraid, I was really afraid of Taylorsville based upon the stories that I had heard from my cousins who had gone there. They, they had, my impression was that they had pretty bad experiences, pretty negative ones. So I was scared, but I had some friends and I was enjoying work and I worked with some people that went there. And so I was just like, yeah, cool, let's go. So I started going to, um, Taylorsville High. I had my driver's license. Um, man, I remember the day I got my driver's license. <laughs> I'd been driving for my mom randomly, like with her, you know, but she's like, go run errands or whatever. Um, there was a big shift the day I got my driver's license. Like, we did the thing, whatever, go get the driver's license. Cool, all right, got my driver's license, go back home. And I'm like, okay, well, I'm gonna go, mom. You know, no big deal. I step outside to like go somewhere, to like take the car and go somewhere. <laughs> I had this rush of the sense of freedom. Oh my God, I'm free. Oh my. I can go anywhere I want. Not that I'm gonna go anywhere, but I can go anywhere I want and nobody's gonna tell me what to do. Nobody's watching over me. I have, I can go anywhere I want. <laughs> I have come to a whole new level of experiencing freedom in my current life. I feel like my whole life has been leading me up to this point of freedom. I've wanted to live free. I've been working my butt off to figure out how to live free and somehow I got here. I am living for free. Freedom isn't without money, it's not without work, it's a state of mind. It is the spins in your mind tie you down, that make you feel stuck. It is the obligation that takes away from the freedom. It's attachment. It's thinking that you're attached to something. It's, it's addiction or thinking that you are an addict, believing that you're an addict. That's where the shift came. I believed that I was an addict. I remember as a teenager, my mom telling me why not to do drugs, why not to drink alcohol or smoke cigarettes, do all these things that, um, you know, our culture tells us is bad, especially the Mormon culture. I don't believe there's such thing as bad. But I had to make that choice. I had to make that choice of whether to believe or not. And I had this breakthrough. I had this realization that I, just because my mom said that she's an addict and I come from a line of addicts and therefore I'm really prone to addiction, so just be careful. You know, I, I experienced addiction. I did. but that does not have to define me in the rest of my life. I am not an addict for the rest of my life. In fact, all I had to do was change my mind. All I had to do was go, oh, just because my mom told me an addict, I was an addict, she believed that she was an addict, 
she believed that I had the in me. It's just a belief. Poof. Gone. I'm in full control. I'm in charge. This is my life. I was an addict of a lot of things. I was an addict of sexual experiences, especially. And they were controlling me, that desire, that desire for sexual pleasure, for sexual ecstasy was, it was controlling me. And um, I've been dissecting that. I'm in a whole new world of dissecting who I am. And in part of discovering that, I'm discovering how to meet my needs. And I'll tell you what, I have been not experiencing sexual pleasures in that, that way. Um, but I have been experiencing life in a very in a way that I call love making I think that every single moment that life is making love to the moment to whatever's happening a sunset is like the sun is making love to the clouds and it's exploding in color and right now I'm making love to myself by expressing to myself on this phone and then you know, I'm going to put it on YouTube and that'll come out in whatever ways. Um, mm, love. <laughs> so I had this experience yesterday or the day before. No, it was yesterday. Uh, where I was feeling really needy. I was feeling so needy. That's the point. It's like finding ways to meet my needs. How do you find ways to meet your needs? Your needs, you have the sexual desire that's natural, totally part of the makeup of a human being. And it feels so strong and that I've always felt dissatisfied. Like I haven't gotten what I wanted. Like I get it for a little while and then it goes away and I'm like, oh, I'm so sad and lonely. Why am I not getting what I want? I've been feeling that a lot lately. Like, I get to this place that feels like desperation, and then I'm so needy that nobody's even attracted to me. So then how am I supposed to get my need met? <sighs> I had this experience yesterday where I was feeling that. I was feeling that desperation. And depletion like my love tank was low I had this week of just giving and giving and giving and giving to all of the kids at the community and giving to my kittens and giving to adult children and just like gave so much of myself away that I was depleted and then of course what is it that I want to fill me back up I want sex why do I want sex why why is that the thing that I want what is this thing? What am I? What? A, what am I here for? I started finding ways to meet this need, one piece at a time, and in doing so, I realized I was dissecting what it means to have sex. Sex is one really powerful experience that has so many components to it that meet and fill up to our cups. I sat by a friend and I laid on their lap and they gave me a shoulder massage and that felt really good. That was like, oh, thank you. I'm struggling so hard. My love tank's so low. I'm depleted. Oh. I do. I want to have sex with someone, but I don't want to have sex with you. <laughs> but you're the only one here, so what do I do? They gave me a massage. And that helped a little. And then I, I went and climbed a tree and was in a tree, and that gave me some me time and some connect with the earth time. And then I felt the call to go see my friend up on the hill. And I sat with him, and he shared 
with me some pleasure. You shared with me some medicine and we sat and we talked and I realized I needed somebody to talk to. And you gave me a space in which my walls could drop so I could talk. And that was another need. With sex, you, you, your walls drop. Your walls have to drop in order to connect so closely with somebody. I like that feeling. I like my walls being dropped. It felt good to talk to him and drop my walls. And you rubbed my feet. Gave me some more love. And then I went on to go talk to another friend because I needed a thing. And this friend happened to be up at their house and they were naked. And it's not a big deal that they're naked at all, but I laid next to them and I got a little cuddle and something about them being naked like filled my cup up a little bit more. It's like, it's like another layer of walls that was down, you know, like their walls were down. And then they held me and gave me some tenderness. And I needed that tenderness. And they looked me in the eyes and gave me eye contact. These beautiful blue eyes. That filled me up with some more. <sighs> and then... I... Went on a road trip. And I had some me time. And I had some me time to listen to myself, sit with myself, be with my heart. And because I have a bedroom, I have time to masturbate. I have time to fulfill myself sexually. That physical bodily need. And... I also brought my bicycle with me on this little road trip. After that, I got on my bicycle and I went for a ride. And I got this like other need met that was like physical, like vigorous, like having your heart rate up and like for a, you know, a while. I felt me filled me with another need. And at the end of the day, I realized, wow. There's all these components, all these different components to sex and all these different needs that get met. No wonder I want this one ultimate thing that fills me up so quickly, but I don't have to get it that way. There's so many other ways to get this love and experience it and like experience it slow and experience it one piece at a time. The only thing, the only desire that didn't get met in all of that is a desire that I have to make out with somebody. I totally want to like touch my lips to somebody else's lips and have a nice pleasurable connective time. That'll come though. It'll happen eventually. It's got to. I'm desiring it so bad. That it will come to me, I know. That's how this works. When you desire it, you are becoming like a magnet. Okay, so watch out. Mango, watch out. Man, I remember my first kiss. That brings us back to the story when I lived at Grandma's house. I worked at Scone Cutter and I was beginning to develop, to develop feelings for Savannah, and I knew it. But my brother, of course, was like with this chick, of course. <laughs> She's like cuddling with me, and I'm like, oh my gosh. Anyways, and I'm terrified. I'm totally scared that people are going to find out I'm gay, and I'm like, wish I would like guys. And then this guy comes along that I work with. He's like flirting with me, and we like, we started having a lot of fun at work together. I was like, oh, hey, maybe I like this guy. So I started hanging out with this guy. And we had some fun. We went on some dates. And after about a month of, like, kind of dating, um, it was like, first kiss time. It's time for your first kiss. 
and I was like excited and nervous and um, we go to his house and I'm dropping him off at his house and I walk him to the door and there's like a moon out and it's nighttime and it's all sexy and he kisses me and it was horrible it was horrible it was worst it was like so much mouth and so much tongue and it was just like not even fun it was oh my god Ugh. and it was tasted gross and like it was not pleasurable at all whatsoever zero yep <laughs> well that was awkward then I like awkwardly like broke it off with him but we still worked together and then it was like awkward and weird and yeah whatever that happened for a while uh, Savannah laughed at me she's like yeah that's usually how first kisses go but really I was like oh make out with me Savannah <laughs> Uh, Savannah was going through a hard time her parents divorced they moved different places she eventually moved to St. George with her mom I had this really heartbreaking like breakup with her she had all these emotional problems with my family there was drama with her and all my family members and they were like Savannah treats you bad you need to not let her treat you so bad and I had no idea what they were talking about zero clue I was just like so enamored with her I didn't give a shit um, yeah, well, she moved on, thankfully, right before my senior year. And then I spent my senior year, like, I didn't have Savannah. I had me. It was me, all about me. Oh, my gosh. I had so much fun at Taylorsville. It was this really diverse school. It's huge, 6,000 student body. And it was more urban areas, like, more um, poor. And so there was more diversity in the colors of people and the types of people. And that made it for, like, a really good quality experience for me um, a lot of stuff happened one kid um, committed completed suicide at school with a gun in his mouth exploded his brain all over the hallway brains got in the lockers and stuff including mine um, that was this tragedy that was absolutely beautiful um, before that, the school was pretty divided. It's a huge school, and it was very divided between like the popular kids and the not popular kids and the colored kids, right? Like these three like separations. And after he killed himself, um, I witnessed an absolute change. All of a sudden, everybody mixed up. All the groups started intertwi intertwining. And the colored people weren't separate anymore. Everybody was like, whoa guys we need to support each other okay this is a big deal it was cool beautiful like from that i just i learned that like everything is a blessing everything bad happens for a good reason therefore nothing's bad nothing's bad it's all just like beautiful blessings it's all a blessing <laughs> Ah, man. It's good. It's real good. Yep, lived there till um, I graduated high school. And I, uh, you know, moved and went to college. We will tell the rest of that story next time. It's kind of intermingling with like the end of my senior year and what went into college. So we'll save that for the next chapter. Uh, it's good catching up with everybody. Thanks for listening to me. Thanks for listening to me. <laughs> Bye.